Welcome to There is a Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell. I'm an exercise physiologist and personal trainer. I'm the owner of Maxwell's Fitness Programs and I've been in business since 1994. Today's episode is called Don't Let the Tail Wag the Dog. Before I get into that, let me thank our very first sponsors, Jonathan and Lynn Gilden of the Gilden Group at Realty Pros. They are flat out the best real estate agency in our area of Volusia County. They handle Orman, they handle New Smyrna, they handle everywhere. Give them a shout if you're looking for professionals. They can be reached at thegildengroup.com. Don't let the tail wag the dog. I remember I had this client years ago and uh, I used to use that with her all of the time because oftentimes, and many people do this, so not singling out the nameless person here, but uh, it, it was a, a great example of working with somebody who is a runner trying to improve their times and they would use extrinsic variables to measure intensity all the time. And I'd say, look, don't let the tail wag the dog. So in an exercise prescription, and it's not meant to sound overly complicated, but for us professionals that are trying to put together a workout routine for people, we start with what is called the FITTs. Get it? Fit and that stands for frequency, intensity, time, and type. Those things need to be put together in specific doses, right? Just like medication. So therefore, that's why it's like a prescription. So frequency, intensity, time, and type. And we can get fairly objective with some of these training, and then we can go from there. So frequency is how many days per week somebody should do something. Intensity, I'm going to cover here in depth. That's what this podcast is about. Time is the duration, which could be time or distance. So in other words, minutes or miles. And then type, what are you choosing to do? Run, bike, swim, lift, those types of things. The intensity part in all this is the hardest for most people to grasp but it may be the most important. If we're using variables on a run or a walk, on a treadmill, whatever, a bicycle, and we're using variables like speed or even minutes per mile, that's letting the tail wag the dog. So for example, somebody says, on my run, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna run 10 minute miles. Now, it's okay to have a goal, like you have a race goal and you want to hit a certain pace, whether it be a 5K, marathon, whatever, a bike race, a triathlon. You can have pace goals, obviously, but using that as your intensity for training is letting the tail wag the dog. The only true measurements of intensity for a person, like as far as cardiorespiratory goes, the most truest is maximum volume of oxygen or VO2 max. Had to say that slow because we need to get that. VO2 max stands for the amount of oxygen your body can use in a minute. The higher, the better. If you have a high VO2 max, you are in better cardiorespiratory condition. The numbers are going to look like 40 milliliters per kilogram of body weight or 60 milliliters per kilogram of body weight, or the elites get close to 90, which is huge. Average is around 35 for a female, 40 for a male, somewhere in there. So to give you an idea, now some exercise labs, and I used to do it, would test for VO2 max so you can get your number. The problem with that is, is unless you're running around with a oxygen tank on your back, you can't really use it as a guide for intensity, right? How are you going to go around unless you literally have 
this measurement with you. And of course, I'm being silly. That is virtually impossible. Although some people do have that for track purposes to measure. So what we've done then is we've found out that there is a linear relationship between your VO2 max and your heart rate. Meaning, as your VO2 max goes up, your heart rate goes up. So some people will tell you, well, heart rate is a true measurement of intensity. That's not true, but it is 100% correlated with a true measurement of intensity. So therefore, it works. So in a way, what they're saying is true, but just not technically true. All right. So, for example, the higher we get up in our VO2 max, the closer we are to our maximum heart rate. For example, 100% of our VO2 max. So let's just say for for a lesson here that 40 milliliters per kilogram of body weight is your VO2 max. So that would be 100% of your VO2 max. So if you're at 40, you're at 100% of your VO2 max, which means you are at 100% of your maximum heart rate. Now, the lower we go, the more of a gap there is. We found that if you're at 95% of your VO2 max, you are at 90% of your maximum heart rate. If you're at 80% of your VO2 max, you're at 70%. So as we go down, the gap gets bigger. But we know that that is measured, that is found. So therefore, we can use percentages of heart rate as a very good, not perfect, but very good measurement of intensity. So there's one for you. Heart rate is an absolute true measurement of the dog wagging its tail if you are properly using heart rate. Now I say properly because probably you are relying upon your smart watches or if you're old school like me and you remember the formula is 220 minus your age you calculate it by hand to come up with your maximum heart rate research shows that that's only 66 percent accurate 66 percent so one third of the people that use that formula are basically not using their true maximum heart rate I'm one of the lucky ones. I've tested my max heart rate VO2 and I know my age predicted they came out to be almost the same, but really that's pretty much luck. Now, you can do a max heart rate test in the same way that you do a max VO2 test. It's basically going all out as hard as you can. And if you've ever done a 5K or something that really pushed your limits, you know your maximum heart rate because it's going to go up to that level if you really raced the event for sure. So one thing if we're using heart rate is we do have to know if it truly is our maximum heart rate. All right. That's that we have to say that knowing that. And if if you do, or if you get really, really close, then using your heart rate guides on your smartwatches or just knowing your zones is a very good measurement of intensity. So what happens a lot is the old nasty E word, the ego gets in the way of training. Oh, I heard so-and-so runs an eight minute mile. So when I go out, I'm going to try to do an eight minute mile. So you go out and you run an eight minute mile if you can, and you're not really paying attention to your heart rate. And at the end you go, oh, okay, I did that. But then you notice your heart rate at the end was in like your zone four, zone five, which means that's really, really high. That's like your racing heart rate zone or your interval zone. Well, you let the tail wag the dog. Was it supposed to be a hard run or what? And a lot of people are absolutely clueless when it comes to that. They base all of their training zones off of what their ego tells them to do because either what they see other people doing or what maybe they've done in the past. And I can be guilty of that, but they are just going out and we kind of call them one speed willies. Like they don't have an easy day where they're staying in their zone one and two. They don't have a hard day. 
to where they're getting up their heart rate pretty high into intervals. They're kind of always in that comfortably hard zone, which for most people is between 80 or 90%. But that is a not well-trained athlete. That is an athlete that is not going to reach their potential because any athlete or fitness advocate, I mean, we're all athletes, right? If we're getting out there doing sports, physical activity, then we're athletes. So if we want to reach our potential, we want to train in all zones, in all five zones. I mean, some people minimize them down to three. That's fine. Light, medium, and heavy zones. But you want to train in all of the zones to become as fit as you could be. The lower heart rate zones teach you how to burn fat more efficiently, and they they help you recover from more strenuous exercise sessions. The middle zone, the zone three, is that aerobic zone, which really helps your heart get stronger. It also improves the capillary density in your slow twitch muscle fibers by increasing the mitochondria in your slow twitch muscle fibers, which means that when you get up to higher intensities, your body's going to be able to process the oxygen better and therefore utilize it better. So that's a critical zone. So many people don't go in it because they're training above it or below it. They don't go in it. Most of the people train above that. It's supposed to be an aerobic day and you look at their heart rates and you see they were threshold at the very, very lowest. So threshold's got a purpose too. Threshold is your zone fours and that does have a purpose because it's going to teach your body to use lactic acid better but really only 10 to 20 percent of your training should be hard that's it all the other should be zone three and under most people don't know that because they're going by paces like there'll be an eight minute miler somewhere in the eights all the time and if you're really doing zone training there's just no way that that's true there's just no way for most people the zone one would be a walking pace. The zone two would be a very slow jog. So like, let's say they can do a 5K in an eight minute pace or something like that. Their zone two would be like a 12 minute mile. It would be like really, really slow. Their zone three would be like a 10. And they just wouldn't do that because their ego says, oh, I should go faster. And the ego, as Ryan Holiday, one of my favorite podcasts I listen to, Better not be your favorite. This one better be. But one of my favorite, the Daily Stoic, always says ego is the enemy. He wrote a book. And I tell myself that. For example, I'm out on my zone two bike on Saturday. And I'm, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard. You know, you're fighting to keep that heart rate down because it's so freaking hot. I mean, and I got out at 615, 630 on Saturday morning. It was already in the 80s, 100% humidity. So... The heart rate is going to definitely elevate easier in the, in the heat than the cold. So you have to fight to keep it down. Like it wants to go up, but you can't let the tail wag the dog. You have to say, oh, now listen to the heart rate. Listen to the heart rate. Because what's going on in your body physiologically is what's going to change you, is what's going to create adaptations, which makes you fit. Being an idiot and just jamming up to a speed that feels comfortable, feelings definitely aren't facts is just going to accelerate that heart rate and decelerate my recovery in other words i'm going to take longer to recover if i'm in an inappropriate zone so on saturday after about 30 minutes i'd look down and be like geez man it's at 130 already i'm trying to keep it under 134 it's already at 130 so i remembered what ryan holiday always says ego is the enemy so i backed off and i said screw it Got to ride 17 miles an hour. I'm going to ride 17 miles an hour. You know, it's like, it's what I'm going to do because I'm going to wag my own tail, not let my tail wag me. So that is where we get in the problems. We just don't like it sometimes, right? Now, before I wrap up, I, I want to talk about wattage too. So wattage is used a lot on indoor bikes now. Um, and it's, it is a 100% accurate way to gauge your intensity on a bike or any other device that's caught up to it. But usually it's got to be a bike because everything's got to be measured with the flywheel, 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 
and uh, the measurement intensity on the flywheel, the size of the flywheel and all this stuff. So, but all these great, very smart, you know, people that do all that mechanical engineering have figured all that out for us. And so wattages is accurate. So if you know your 100% watt meter, like let's say you can go, I don't know, 500 watts at your peak, then you can come up with percentages of that and do your zone. So like 60% of that would be your zone one, 70% would be your zone two. So you, wattage is accurate. I don't want you to think that only VO2, I mean, there I go. Uh, only heart rate can be a good way for you to measure. You can use watts if you're on a bicycle. So 100 watts is 100 watts. I mean, that's just what it is. You're turning that level of power. Uh, if you're outside doing that and it's humid and stuff, you may find that your heart rate's going to accelerate. So you would want to use those two things together. But the point is, watts isn't really ego, right? I mean, sure, you can know other people's numbers, but still, it, it depends on the conditions. You could be going up a hill, and if you're telling yourself you're only going by miles per hour, but you're on a 5% grade, well, good luck trying to hold your normal miles per hour, but your watts can remain even at that. You're just going to go slower, but you're going to stay in the same watts because you're using more power. So... It is another great way to do it. But don't let the tail wag the dog. Use things that are actual measurements of intensity, such as heart rate, such as watts. If you are, if you have had a VO2 max test and you have a lactate analyzer, that's something I didn't go into because most people that listen to the podcast don't do lactate testing, but that is a byproduct of anaerobic exercise. That's what lactate is. So if you've had a lactate analysis and have all those tools, have at it, because that is a measure of intensity too. All right. Now let me thank our second sponsors, Daytona Beach's own overhead door. Zach and Jeff Hawk are the owners. They do a fantastic job. They sponsor our events. They sponsor this podcast. I mean, you talk about just stewards in the community. It's funny. I got a, uh, a couple new garage door openers over the weekend, and unfortunately our house wasn't built with an overhead door. So I got them at Lowe's and um, trying to program them over the weekend. And, you know, usually I'm okay with stuff like this, but just could not get it. Like, it just won't happen. So Zach comes in in about 40 minutes and like can't wait to ask him because even though it's not overhead door, he's going to he's gonna look at it. He's going to help because they believe in absolute customer service. So check them out at overheaddoordaytona.com. 